Genesis 21, 22 to 34. <clears throat> As we read, let's listen with reverence and, and joy. This is the word of our God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, coming to us through the pen of his servant, the prophet Moses. Hear now God's word. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Well, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray together. In power of the Holy Spirit, to read and hear and digest and receive and believe your word in a way that leads to the, the, the sanctification of us so that we more faithfully reflect the image of your dear son in the earth and our dealings with people in this world in our character and in our conduct Help us to live as citizens of your eternal kingdom more and more and more in this time and place in which we live so that our lives might resound to the praise of your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, you know, it's, it's been said that there are <clears throat> two primary symbols that can aptly sum up the life of Abraham the tent and the altar. The tent and the altar. Abraham's life is a life of the tent and of the altar. The, the tent is a symbol that, that represents Abraham's life in this world as a, as a pilgrim. We've seen him as a, a sojourner and a stranger in a land not yet his own. We've seen him, haven't we? Ever since Genesis 12, as a man who is wandering through this world that is not yet his home. He has, he has a promise from God, of course, that he will one day lay claim to the land of promise as his own. That, that Canaan land, that blessed land, that land of abundance and milk and honey, that land that will one, bit, one day be given to his uh, descendants as their own to possess and dwell therein. But his life has been a life of pilgrimage a life of sojourning. He has yet to dwell in a land that he can call his own. That is his home. His life can be summed up and summarized and symbolized by the tent. But his life can also be summed up and symbolized by, by the altar as well. Because Abraham is not only a sojourner in this world, he's a worshiper. He's not only a pilgrim, but he is a, a praiser of his Lord and God. And we've seen this again and again in stories about Abraham as they'll often conclude with showing him building an altar 
and they're praising and calling upon the name of the Lord in worship and adoration. Abraham is a man who walks in friendship and communion with God, who worships and calls upon the name of the Lord. We see these two aspects of Abraham's life front and center in our passage this morning. We see here Abraham conducting himself in this world as a sojourner and a worshiper, as a pilgrim and a praiser. And we see it in particular in his, his interaction with his, his host sovereign, the, the ruler of the land in which Abraham is currently dwelling. And we've seen this man before, haven't we? His name is Abimelech. And last we saw him, Abraham had, had not conducted himself in a completely commendable way. We saw that in, in Genesis chapter 20. And, and now the point of this passage here, in this encounter with Abimelech, is that here we, we've seen much has changed. Here we see Abraham on the other side of God's fulfilled promise. Isaac, the long-promised son, has arrived. Abraham has seen God's faithfulness wonderfully displayed and his promise faithfully fulfilled at this point in his life. And as a result, Abraham's faith has been seemingly strengthened. Last week, we saw Abraham conduct himself in, in faith and his relationship with Hagar and Ishmael. Back in Genesis 16, we didn't see him conduct himself in faith, but in sin and in doubt when it came to his relationship with Hagar and Ishmael. And similarly, now this morning, while we saw Abraham conduct himself in sin and doubt in relation to Abimelech in Genesis 20, we see him here conduct himself with a strong and unwavering faith. What we're seeing here is a changed Abraham. We're seeing the fruit of strengthened faith. We're seeing an Abraham whose faith is growing strong as a result of God's faithfulness and his fulfilled promise. And we learn much from Abraham's faith-filled conduct here as we ourselves are also a people of the tent and the altar in our day and age. You know, we too, like our father Abraham, are called to be a people of the tent and of the altar. We are a people of the tent in that as Christians, we are not citizens of this world, but citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. We are awaiting the arrival of our King and Sovereign Christ. We're awaiting the arrival of the new heaven and the new earth. We're awaiting the arrival of the new Jerusalem, all of which we believe and hope in by faith. And while we're waiting, we wander through this world as sojourners and strangers, as, as the world presently is. In fact, that's what the Apostle Peter calls us. He calls New Covenant believers in 1 Peter 2.11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. We are sojourners and strangers in this world. We live as resident aliens in the land, in the, city, in the cities in which we live. We are a people of the tent. And we're a people of the altar too. We're a people called to live as, as worshipers of Yahweh in this world. Not swearing ultimate allegiance to any kingdom or ruler or city or culture or party. But we're to worship God alone, and swear ultimate allegiance only to Him. We are called to be a people, Jesus says, who worship Him in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. We are a people of the altar. And so as people of the tent and the altar here, like our father Abraham, we glean much from his conduct in Genesis 21, from seeing him interact with the civil authorities, the earthly governments of the land in which he dwelled, we can learn much about how we're to relate to the, the civil authorities, the earthly governments and rulers in the place in which we dwell. And in seeing him devote himself to the worship of his God, we can see how we as Christians are meant to be a, a very different and peculiar kind of people in the world in which we live, as people of the altar. We see here from Abraham that as people of the tent and the altar... We're to be a people of respect and cooperation in the world. We're to be a people of truth and reproof in the world. And we're to be a people of worship and holiness in the world. First, we're to be a people of respect and cooperation. Now, as I mentioned, Abraham is, is dwelling in, in, in lands in which Abimelech is king. Abimelech is, is a pagan civil authority over a, a pagan city and people. And as such... 
He is Abraham's host sovereign, isn't he? Abraham's not a, a city of Abimelech city, the city of Gerar, but Abraham is sojourning in the lands over which Abimelech has dominion. And of course, uh, Abraham and Abimelech have, have already encountered one another in just the previous chapter where Abraham, let's just say it, he, he treated Abimelech rather badly, deceiving him, and he did so out of a deep-seated fear and anxiety, all rooted in this lack of faith and trust in Yahweh. And yet at the same time, in that encounter, Abraham was still used mightily of God to represent the Lord and to bless Abimelech in his city. Now, this passage takes place years down the road from that initial encounter. And in that time, Abimelech has seemingly been kind of keeping his eye on Abraham here, perhaps with suspicion. But even still, as he's done so, he's, he's seen the ways in which the Lord has blessed Abraham. And so in verse 22, he says, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, well, they came to Abraham and said to him, God is with you in all that you do. It, it seems obvious to him. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land that you have sojourned. Now, what's happening here is that Abimelech is coming to Abraham to try to enter into covenant with him. He wants Abraham to swear an oath of friendship and loyalty to him, to deal kindly with him. Uh, that, that Hebrew word there translated as kindly, there, that's, that's a covenantal word that means like a, a covenant loyalty. It, it was very common in that time and place for kings of cities and peoples to approach one another and to seek to establish covenant with each other, to become each other's allies, as it were, to ensure that if either parties uh, ever entered into conflict, that, that they would come to each other's aid, or also that they wouldn't enter into conflict with each other. And it seems that that's what Abimelech is seeking to do here. Now notice here that Abimelech doesn't just come on his own. He also brings a man named Phicol, the commander of his army. He brings, you know, kind of his, his, his hired muscle. He brings a, a show of strength here. It seems like Abimelech is seeking to intimidate Abraham in some respect. And, and, and you can see why. Abimelech, he sees this man, Abraham, with his enormous household, with all of his servants and all of his trained men sojourning in his lands. Remember back in Genesis 14, when Abraham raised up an army of 318 trained men from his household, and he put powerful armies to flight with them? You know, he, he, he probably has even more trained men at this point in his life. And so it seems Abimelech sees this. He's feeling intimidating himself, intimidated himself. And so he brings Phicol, the commander of his army, as he seeks to strike a covenant with Abraham. He's also trying to strike fear in Abraham's heart in an effort to show Abraham, this is in your best interest. You would do well to fear me and my army. It would benefit you to enter into covenant with me and become my ally. But of course, next, you know, Abimelech kind of shows his hand his words in verse 23 shows that he's actually the one who's feeling intimidated. He's fearing for himself and his people and his descendants because of the largeness of Abraham's household and the Lord's lavish blessing on Abraham and all that he does. Abimelech wants to ensure that Abraham, with, with his enormous household, with the obvious blessing of God on his life, that he's not going to do anything to threaten or endanger Abimelech and his kingdom and his dynasty. How many of you know in life, that it's, it's often those who present a show of power and strength that actually feel the most fearful and vulnerable inside. You know, it's often those who try outwardly to show themselves the strongest that actually feel the most weak and afraid inside. And that seems to be the case here. Bimlech shows up with a show of power, the commander of his army, his hired muscle, but he does so because he's feeling afraid and vulnerable with Abraham sojourning in his lands. But even with all that, Abraham still conducts himself with a spirit of respect and cooperation, doesn't he? His initial response to Abimelech is, is to agree. Verse 24 says, I, I will swear. Right? He, he recognizes Abimelech's legitimate authority as his host sovereign He's willing to cooperate with Abimelech and treat him with respect because Abraham believes that he is a divinely ordained position in the world. And note, he doesn't do this because he's afraid. 
Abraham is not cowering in fear before Abimelech here. Notice that as he enters into covenant relationship with Abimelech, he also reproves and rebukes Abimelech for the actions of some of his men. Some of his men had seized a well of water that Abraham had dug and used. Of course, you know, water in that part of the world was hard to come by. They were living in a desert. Remember I said last week, 6 to 12 inches of rain a year. In a land such as that, you need access to water. For a household the size of Abraham's, you need access to lots of water, several wells. And it seems one of those wells that Abraham had dug for himself and his household had been forcibly taken by some of Abimelech's men. That word translated as seized there means to be taken with the use or threat of violence. This well had been stolen. And that's what, Abimelech, uh, that's what Abraham is reproving Abim- Abimelech about. So note here, Abraham is not afraid to rebuke Abimelech about this. Abraham is not cowering in fear here as he did in Genesis 20. Abraham is bold to rebuke him, which we'll talk more about in a few moments. But, but even still here, even with that, he's treating Abimelech with respect. He's cooperating with Abimelech and his desires to enter into a mutually beneficial relationship, even to the point where Abraham offers up seven female lambs to Abimelech as essentially payment for the well. Of course, Abimelech's men were in the wrong. They stole this this well with the threat of violence toward Abraham and his household, and yet essentially Abraham says, okay, just so there's no confusion and no bad blood between you and me, I'm going to pay you for the well, and these seven ewe lambs will confirm that I own it. And then as a result, the place in which Abimelech and Abraham entered into covenant with each other is called Beersheba, which is a word that can either mean well of seven or well of oath, since the words for seven and oath in Hebrew sound remarkably similar. Now again, notice here how respectful and cooperative Abraham is. He's conducting himself with with honor toward Abimelech as the sovereign of the lands in which he's dwelling. Abraham is a sojourner. He's a stranger in a strange land. And as such, he recognizes Abimelech's position and authority as king, and he shows him respect and honor, which is an act of faith, if you think about it. You know, if Yahweh is God over all, if Abraham's God is the creator and sustainer and sovereign over all heaven and earth, like we've sang up this morning, then even earthly pagan kings and civil authorities are appointed by his hand and his power. They are instruments of his will being accomplished in the world. Earthly kings and political authorities are appointed by God. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1 and 2, where he writes, Let every person be subject to governing authorities. There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So you see here, Abraham is conducting himself with respect and not resistance toward Abimelech because he recognizes that Abimelech's position is divinely ordained. It's instituted by and under the sovereign God. And so as an act of faith in God and in his sovereignty over such appointments, Abraham respects and does not resist Abimelech. Of course, that should be true of us today as Christians. As the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, we should honor our governing authorities. We should show them proper respect Christians should be the most respectful citizens in whatever nation and city and place in which we find ourselves. Even though we're we're ultimately citizens of heaven and sojourners here in the time in which we live, even though we don't ultimately belong to any earthly city or nation as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we represent heaven here on earth by conducting ourselves with respect toward our earthly rulers and authorities. Now, I can hear some of you thinking right now as I say that. Well, not always, right? Not always. We're, we're not always to submit to, to governing authorities. There are exceptions, and that's true. There are times, rare occasions, in which Christians ought to engage in civil disobedience to governing authorities, of course. There are times when Christians must, out of our ultimate loyalty and allegiance to the Lord alone, 
where we must disobey governing authorities. If ever governing authorities command and seek to require us to disobey and dishonor God, we can say what the Apostle Peter once said in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. However, our ordinary and default posture toward governing authorities as Christians always ought to be submission and respect and cooperation, recognizing that they are ordained and instituted by our God. You can also imagine someone thinking, of course, well, you know, it might be easy for Abraham with Abimelech, right? Abimelech seems to be a pretty decent pagan all in all, right? He seemed pretty decent in, in Genesis chapter 20. If you have a pagan ruler like Abimelech, seems to have a measure of integrity. Well, wouldn't it be easier to respect and honor them? But, but what do you do about rulers and civil authorities who are dishonest or corrupt or unprincipled? We should say that, that you know, when the apostles wrote those words from Romans 13 or, or 1 Peter 2 in the New Testament, well, the, the emperor during that time was none other than Nero himself. Nero, the debauched, corrupt, cruel Roman emperor, sexual deviant, had his opponents murdered, some of his own family members murdered. He started a fire in Rome to, to, to he burn down half of Rome, and then he blamed it on the Christians. He executed many of them for it. He was not a man of integrity. In terms of his personal character and conduct, he was not worthy of respect. And yet the apostles tell us, even if we cannot respect the ruler's personal character and conduct, We must respect the office and position they hold because it's one divinely ordained and instituted by God. We must conduct ourselves with respect and cooperation toward our governing authorities for that very reason. We must be a people of respect and cooperation. Now, how do we do that in our time and place? Now, I very much doubt that like the the president of the United States is ever going to come to some of you and seek to establish a personal covenant to work out matters with a well that you dug on your property. I doubt that's ever going to happen, but, you know, this is all pretty peculiar to Abraham's situation here, but even still, this text is extremely relevant. There are ways in which we can and should mimic the spirit of Abraham's conduct here. For one, we should learn from Abraham here that we're to honor governing authorities in our speech. In our speech. How do you speak about governing authorities in conversations with friends, when you're on break at, at work with your coworkers, How do you speak about governing authorities when you post on social media? How do you speak about the rulers that God has ordained? You speak about them with respect and honor and deference. Or do you speak about them with mockery and disdain and contempt? This is especially important in an election year right? Temperatures are, are high right now. Civility and respect are in low supply. You know, that's, that's something we can expect to see among the people of this world, but it, it ought not be so among the people of God. We don't take our cues on how to speak about governing authorities from political pundits or our biased news sources. As Christians, we submit ourselves to the Word of God and to the kind of conduct and speech it requires of us, and it requires that we speak with respect toward our political authorities, even of those with whom we have significant differences. You know, many of those who, who get so riled up and speak with disdain about our civil leaders, the reason they do so is because they're setting their ultimate hopes on getting their candidate in place come November. You know, of course, temperatures will be high. Of course, they'll resort to mockery and name-calling and contempt because their idols are on the line. But for Christians, our God is never on the line. For Christians, our God, whatever comes, whatever happens come November, our God is sovereign in upholding all things Right? That doesn't mean that we're passive or uninvolved, but it does mean that we can engage in the political process and engage in political conversation without any sort of political anxiety and with the disrespect that results from it. Because we believe that whatever comes, our sovereign God is the one who is seated upon the throne of all heaven and earth and who is ultimately in control of all things. 
We believe that the resurrected and ascended Christ is right now upholding the universe by the word of his sovereign power. We believe that there are no rogue molecules in the universe in which he is sovereign king, let alone rogue appointments to earthly governments. And therefore, we are those who thereby are empowered to engage in that process in a non-anxious way and in a way that, that embodies the Apostle Peter's calling in 1 Peter 2.17, to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. We speak with respect and honor toward all and especially toward those over us in earthly governments, whether we agree with them or not, whether they're who we wanted or not, because God has appointed them and we trust him. Next, we also honor governing authorities in our personal interactions. Again, of course, the vast majority of us are never going to interact with those who are in the highest offices of our land, but even still, 1 Peter 2, 13, 14, the Apostle Peter tells us to honor and respect all who are in high positions, whether it be the emperor supreme or the governors who are sent by him. You know, most of us are never going to interact with the President of the United States, but we might meet our local mayor those who serve in various offices in City Hall will likely interact with those in law enforcement at some point or another. Some of us in the military might interact with those in high positions they're in. We're all in some way going to interact with some lower positions of governmental authority. And when we do, we should conduct ourselves with respect and honor and deference. We should be friendly and amicable. All because we know those who are in high positions, those who fill them, are not the result of accident or mere human will. They're there by the will and ordination of the God of heaven. We should honor those in governmental authority because we honor the God who placed them there. And lastly, with our prayers, our prayers, we should honor governing authorities by, by praying for them. Like the Apostle Paul writes, 1 Timothy 2.1, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions. We're to pray and give thanks for the one who fills the highest political office of our land and for all who are in high positions, he says. Now, many of us as Christians disrespect and complain about governing authorities, but do we, do we pray for them? Do we pray for them more than we post on social media about them? You know, the scriptures only command one of those things. We're to go to the Lord on their behalf and ask for his blessing upon them, to ask for his will to be accomplished through them, for his help and care to make them into just rulers, good rulers who govern with integrity and skill and honor. We're to ask the Lord for their salvation, conversion if they don't know him. We're to seek the Lord and pray to him on their behalf as a way of honoring and respecting them in their office as a people of the tent and the altar. As people who trust the Lord Most High, we're to be a people of respect and cooperation in these ways in the land in which we sojourn. But with that, even while we're called to be a people of respect and cooperation, we're also called to be a people of truth and reproof. As those who, who ultimately don't swear allegiance or belong to any earthly kingdom or nation, whose ultimate allegiances belong alone with our God and, and King and with His heavenly kingdom, as those who therefore live in this world as sojourners and strangers and who are called to, to, to represent heaven here, we also sometimes must be a people of truth and reproof, even while living with respect and cooperation. We see this in Abraham here. Bimelech comes to Abraham, seeks to enter into covenant relationship with him, seeks Abraham as an ally. Remember, last time Abraham encountered Abimelech, he acted out of fear and anxiety, all because his faith in the Lord and in his promises was wavering. Abraham was not trusting the Lord to be his faithful covenant God. The Lord had promised Abraham to bless him, protect him, and preserve him, to preserve his, his family line, to give him the child of promise, to produce a great nation out of him. And yet in Genesis 20... Abraham acted as if he had to take God's promises into his own hands. And he deceived Abimelech from that, that place of fear and lack of faith. He interacted with Abimelech from a place of fear and lack of faith. 
Perhaps Abimelech is, is expecting to meet a similar sort of Abraham here, and that's why he brings his hired muscle. Right? He thinks he's going to encounter an Abraham who's, whose knees are shaking. However, the, the Abraham he encounters here is a changed man. He's walking through this world and, and going through this, sanct- this process of sanctification. He's growing strong in faith as he gives glory to God, Paul says. The, the, the Abraham Abimelech encounters here has seen the promises of God fulfilled. He's grown strong in faith and thereby has grown strong in courage and boldness and stoutness of heart. And that's what faith in God and His promises produces in us. Remember how Abimelech comes to Abraham with a show of strength and power, all because he actually feels weak and vulnerable. Well, Abimelech conducted himself in that way. He feels weak and vulnerable in this way because he has no certainty of his future based on the promises and sovereignty of God. Abraham, on the other hand, He doesn't need to give a show of of power or force. Nor does he need to cower in fear at the the feet of his earthly ruler. Rather, Abraham can simultaneously conduct himself with respect and boldness. Because he knows that while this earthly ruler is ordained and instituted by God, the God who instituted this ruler is the ruler of all heaven and earth, and he's sworn to be Abraham's God and protector. He has good plans for Abraham and his future. Beloved, because of who our God is, because of his sovereignty, because of his promises, we can live, we are empowered to live as those who show respect without fear and who are also bold without disrespect. We can be so secure in God and His promises that we can respectfully speak up in this world the face of injustice and iniquity without fear. We know what our future ultimately holds. And we can be so secure in this world that we don't need to give a show of power to cover up our weaknesses and fear. See that in Abraham here. He gently reproves Abimelech about this matter of of, of this well. Some of Abimelech's men took the well by force, and Abraham rebukes Abimelech about this matter. He respectfully and meekly charges Abimelech and his men with wrongdoing. Of course, it seems here, Abimelech claims that he had no knowledge of the matter, although in like one sentence he gives like three excuses. I don't know. But either way, whether by intention or by negligence, he's in the wrong here. As the ruler, he's at fault here. He needs to to rectify this situation. He needs to assume responsibility for it. Therefore, Abraham is right in confronting Abimelech about this matter and to seek its resolution as they enter into covenant with each other. This is a matter that's got to be worked out if they're going to continue this relationship of respect and cooperation. And so as a man of the tent and of the altar, as a man who's grown strong in faith in Yahweh, he's a man of truth and reproof here. And just so, as Christians, as sojourners in this present evil age, as people who trust in the Lord God Almighty and who have grown bold and courageous by our faith in Him, as we relate to governing authorities, we're also called to be a people of truth and reproof. Sometimes when our earthly government and those in high positions overstep their bounds, or when they commit or tolerate or legislate injustice, Sometimes our identity as sojourners and strangers in this world requires us to speak up and to be a people of truth and reproof toward our earthly leaders, all while maintaining that spirit and posture of respect and cooperation. One pastor communicated this very well when writing that believers are to be model citizens, known as law-abiding, not rabble-rousing, obedient rather than rebellious, respectful of government rather than demeaning of it, and yet at the same time, we must speak against sin, against injustice, against immorality and ungodliness with fearless dedication. But we must do it within a framework of civil law and with respect towards civil authorities. We are to be a godly society, doing good and living peaceably with an ungodly society manifesting our transformed lives so that the saving power of God is clearly seen. 
Indeed, we're to be a people who show respect and cooperation, but who also simultaneously speak up and speak the truth in the face of injustice. You know, when we think about that, that way of life and that manner of relating to those in authority, many of us might think of, of MLK as a kind of exemplary model of that. In many ways, he, he spoke out against injustice and sin and ungodliness in our nation, and yet he always seemed to do so with respect and honor and a, a spirit of desiring cooperation, didn't he? And with that, he, he, he also called upon his brothers and sisters in Christ to do the same. And in one letter, he, he particularly called on white pastors in his day to speak up and speak out against the gross injustices that he and other black Americans continually faced. At that time, many of the white church leaders were, were silent in the face of those gross injustices faced by black Americans. And, and so in his justly famous letter, the letter from Birmingham jail, King admonished Christians to be people of truth and reproof in this present evil age. He wrote this saying, in deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. Yes, I love the church. I love her sacred walls. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and fear of being nonconformist. The contemporary church is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of the way of things as they are. Indeed, King rightly expected Christians to be people who speak the truth in the face of injustice, who reprove governing authorities that promote iniquity. That's part of our calling as sojourners who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. If we, if we see racism and prejudice abound, when we see the evil of abortion sanctioned, when we see sexual immorality and homosexuality blessed and celebrated, when we see the exploitation or abuse of women in the, in the lives of politicians, when we see sin and iniquity and injustice practiced and promoted by our governing authorities, we should not keep silent. Even while we conduct ourselves with respect and honor, we must also be a people of boldness and of courage who speak words of truth and reproof in the face of blatant evil. Just as Abraham did here with Abimelech concerning the matter of this well and its violent season. Our faith in God and in His promises means that while we respect and honor all, we fear no man. With the psalmist of, of Psalm 118.6, the Lord is on my side, we say, I will not fear. What can man do to me? As we sojourn in this age, we can look ahead to a future that no one can threaten or thwart. We look forward to a life that no one can take away, even while we live as people of the tent now. And for that reason, we're not only people of the tent, we're also people of the altar. We're people of worship and of holiness. We're people of worship and of holiness. Our passage concludes with these final three verses telling us that they made a covenant at Beersheba, then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Of course, we should know that in Abraham's day, Abimelech's land was not actually the land of the Philistines. It, it was in Moses' day when Moses was writing this. So you might ask, why, why does Moses call it the land of the Philistines? Some might say it's just a present day marker for his audience so that they know where Abimelech's kingdom and city were. But I think it's actually deeper than that. The land of the Philistines in Moses' day was a land that represented idolatry and worldliness. It represented the nations with all their idolatry and all their iniquity, their false gods and their, 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 their fallen ways of life. And so Abimelech and, and Phicol return to that place and to that way of life, but Abraham, notice, does not go with them. Abraham and Abimelech enter into a mutually benefit, be, beneficial covenant, but still, in the end, they go their separate ways. 
Abimelech to the land of the Philistines, and Abraham into the worship and presence of his God. They're temporary allies as much as it mutually benefits both parties, but they are not the same. Abraham is different and set apart in this world. Richard Phillips comments on this. He says, what a vital mistake the church makes today when it forgets the fundamental antithesis between the church and the world. The church is in the world and should seek its peace, but the church should never be of the world. There can never be a walking together in true fellowship with those who do not call on the name of the Lord in faith. There is never a kingdom, a political party, a class of society to which the church can offer full allegiance. Jesus declared to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, we are a people of holiness. As sojourners and strangers in this world, as citizens of God's eternal kingdom, we will never fully belong to any earthly group, any society, party, nation, people, culture. Rather, we are and will always be people, ultimately speaking, of Christ's eternal kingdom, which is a kingdom not of this world. This land we live in is not our land. The U.S. is ultimately not our country. Heaven is our country. Thus, we will always be set apart here. We will always be holy, distinct, marked off from the world. We are a people of holiness. And that holiness, that set-apartness is most clearly seen in our worship. All right, we see Abraham here go on to worship Yahweh. Ab- Abimelech returns to his home, the land of the Philistines. And Abraham returns to his home, the Lord, the everlasting God. Abimelech and and Phicol return to the land of idolatry. And Abraham turned to the one true God in worship and adoration. Verse 33 says, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now normally when we see Abraham worship in Genesis, he Genesis, he he constructs an altar. He does something peculiar here. He plants a tamarisk tree, which is a type of evergreen. And he plants this tree in order to commemorate the ways in which the Lord blessed him in our passage. Sometimes people do this. You know, uh, my, my parents do this. They've planted two trees in their backyard, each for the weddings of their two sons. Every time we, we go to their backyard, we, we see those trees and we remember, oh, that's That tree's getting pretty big. I guess our wedding was 13 years ago. I guess that wedding was 15, 16 years ago, wasn't it? And we remember the Lord's blessing on us as a family, what we celebrated on those days, the goodness of the Lord that we've experienced in our marriages. Well, in the same way, as Abraham is going to continue to dwell here in Beersheba, verse 34 says, for many days, he's going to be able to continue to look upon that tree and remember what the Lord has done for him here. Here in Genesis 21, Abraham is being given a measure of peace and rest as a sojourner. He gets to enjoy here a a measure of security and peace at Beersheba that that he's probably not experienced ever since he left his home and family back in Genesis 12. What a a gift that is. What a grace. what What a thing to be thankful for. And yet even still, he doesn't look on the land of his earthly sojourning as the object of his ultimate hope and rest, does he? Where does he look? He he looks to none other than Yahweh El Olam, the Lord, the everlasting God. He worships God for the peace and rest he's experiencing in this land. He looks to the Lord for his peace and rest, ultimately speaking, and rightly so. You know, beloved Kingdoms rise and they fall. Kings and presidents ascend and descend. They live and they die. There is only one king and one kingdom that will never end. And we can rest assured of that in our day and time because like Abraham, we live on the other side of God's fulfilled promises. Abraham stepped into this encounter with Abimelech in faith and rest and respect and courage because he had grown confident in God and his promises, because God had already shown Abraham his faithfulness in the birth of Isaac. 
but we've seen the fulfillment of better promises. We've seen the birth and arrival of Abraham's greater son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ and the Son of the everlasting God. He's come to live the life that we ought to have lived. He's died the death that we deserve to die in our place and all so that our God and King will forgive us and grant us citizenship in His eternal kingdom. And three days later, Christ rose again from the dead. And then He ascended into heaven there to reign on the throne of all heaven and earth there to reign as our God and King, so that all who place their faith and trust in Him are granted the right to live as citizens of His eternal kingdom. And one day He's going to return, and when He does, all the temporary governments of this fallen world will conclude and give way to the eternal government of our King in Christ. And He will make all things new reigning forevermore in the new heaven and the new earth that he's preparing for those who belong to him. And in that day, we sojourners will be home and we will worship him as the Lord, the everlasting God, forever and ever.